Turkey. I, I am now going to turn the floor over to, I'm very happy to turn the floor over to Pratyush Chandra, who is responsible for, in, in some ways, for bringing this wonderful book to together. Pratyush is visiting us from to Delhi. Go to Sam. And Pratyush, the floor is yours. The Zoom floor Thank is you. yours. Welcome. Thank you. So how much time do I have? Big you have five to eight minutes. Oh, thank you. So that should be enough. So I have prepared a little bit after uh, getting an email from Michael. Uh, so I prepared some notes. So I will be reading from those notes. So it goes like this. Darko Suvin's translation of Beth's Manifesto was introduced to us years ago. At that time, I and my comrades in various Marxist political formations in India were struggling to understand the crisis of the Indian left post-Soviet collapse of its theory and practice. Obviously, the dominant tendency was organizational existentialism of defending the politico-ideological forms that despite their loss of appeal among the working class, somehow sustained through their productivization and instrumentalization in the larger bourgeois polity of India. For us, the text provided us a concrete example of taking the political task of defamiliarizing Marxist and other Marxist works in our practice seriously, so that we are able to read them afresh and in an active manner. With regard to Marx and Engels's Communist Manifesto, there has been a continuous effort to reread them. In the prefaces that Marx and Engels wrote for various German editions and translations, they themselves reread the text in specific geographical and historical contexts. These prefaces gave them opportunities to rehistoricize the text itself and show the unfolding of the general tendencies of the dynamics of capitalism and class struggle in multiple contexts, constituting specific forms of social relations and conflicts. The various prefaces along with innumerable commentaries that have been and are still being written demonstrate not so much the timelessness of the ideas in the manifesto but their timeliness. They flow with the flow of time. The manifesto is able to capture the rhythm and the constitutive essence of the capitalist space time and its subversion in the proletarian everydayness. Hence, the ritualization and dogmatization of the ideas therein could never fully succeed. In almost all the prefaces, the central idea is that in accordance to time and space, the state of things may have altered. But it is thus that the general principles are specified. It is recognized that the practical applications of the principles are dependent on historical conditions. Hence, Marx and Engels, without any remorse, declared in the 1872 German edition that revolutionary measures enumerated in section two must be altered according to time and place. Similar was the case of section four about the communists' relations with other parties, which were in principle correct, but most of the parties had already been eliminated by the progress of history itself. However, one of the most important ideas in the prefaces, with significant implications for political theory and practice even now, comes from, the, from Marx and Engels' endeavor to integrate the lessons of the Paris Commune in their critical engagement with their own text. These lessons and the critique of the political economy that Marx pursued made them stress the organicity of the capitalist nature of state, which makes it unviable or even self-defeating for working class takeover in the transition beyond capitalism. In an incipient form, this understanding was already there in Marx's initial attempts to theorize the foundation and development of state while critiquing Hegel. <clears throat> Incorporating this idea in the prefaces must have been necessitated by Lasallianism 
other trade unionist and statist tendencies dominating the working class politics. The exercise of rereading is never complete with regard to such texts. And only in this exercise, it would be possible to revitalize its propaganda effect, as Berthold Brecht once put in his journals. The task that he undertakes in his unfinished versification of the manifesto contained in this volume. What Brecht endeavors to do in this text is to defamiliarize the manifesto and demonstrate the vitality of its ideas to articulate mm -hmm. the horizons of hope and utopia that could be visualized from his ground. I think Darko's introductory essay on anti-utopia in the booklet is very important in this regard as it shows how anti-utopia technicizes utopian energy. The essay gives us a key to comprehend how the vision of the communist horizon is the only coherent antithesis of the ideology of anti-utopia. As Darko says, radical utopianism is the only chance to fight anti-utopia. In the end, I would like to reiterate an oft forgotten definition of communism that Marx gave. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established, an ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. The conditions of this movement result from the premises now in existence. To complement this, I would like to quote from another philosopher of utopia and hope, Ernst Bloch, and I quote, in bourgeois society, says the communist manifesto, the past rules over the present. In communist society, the present rules over the past. And the present rules together with the horizon within it, which is the horizon of the future and which gives to the flow of the present specific space, the space of new, visibly better present. Thus the beginning philosophy of revolution, that is of changeability for the better, was ultimately revealed on and in the horizon of the future with the science of the new and power to guide it. This shows the importance of the idea of utopia for us communists. Thank you. Thank you, Pratim. Uh, and now, now we will hear from Niraj, uh, where I, I'm looking. There you are. It, it is your uh, moment to speak for five to eight minutes on your role in this book, Niraj. Welcome. You need to unmute, Niraj. Okay, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> it's really wonderful <clears throat> to be part of this great event. I'm going to read out some excerpts from Suwin's translation of Brecht's The Manifesto. Lines 1 to 14. Wars are destroying the world, and the ruins are visibly haunted by an enormous specter, not simply born of war. In peace, it could already be cited, terror to the rulers, but friend to the children of slums. In scanty kitchens, often it peeps, horrified, angry, into the ha half-empty pots. Often it waits for the exhausted in front of shipyards and mines. It visits friends in jails, passing without passport. Even in offices it may be seen, and in lecture rooms heard. At times it dons a hat of steel, enters huge tanks, and flies with deadly bombers. It speaks in many tongues, in all of them, and in many it holds its tongue. It sits as a guest of honor in hovels, a headache of villas. It has come to cho change all things and stay forever. Its name is communism. Verse 47 to 50. For deeper and longer lasting than the wars our primers render are the wars of classes, 
open or secret, not for enemy cities, but for their own, ending only in revolution or in a joint downfall of the fighters, rulers and ruled. Verse 203 to 206. But liberty, equality, fraternity, what happened to it? <clears throat> Freedom for the bourgeois to ex is to exploit people, say the classics. Equality before the law for the rich and poor to buy palaces or to be permitted to sleep under the bridge arches. Verse 219 to 244. Colossal crises recurring in cycles, similar to huge and blindly groping hands, that grip and throttle commerce, convulse in speechless rage, companies, markets, and homes. Immemorial hunger had plagued the world when granaries emptied. Now, nobody knows why we are hungry when they are too full. Mothers find nothing in their bare pantry to fill the small mouths, while the sky, while sky high mountains of grain rot behind walls. And while bales upon bales of cloth are warehoused, the ragged family overnight kicked out of its rented home wanders freezing through emptied city quarters. He who cursed exploiters now cannot find exploiters. Ceaseless was his work. Ceaseless is now his search for work but the gate is locked. Alas, even hell functions no longer. Where now? The giant edifice of civil society built with so much exertion by so many sacrificed generations sinks back into barbarism. Not the too little is threatening. The too much makes it totter. The house does not exist for dwelling the cloth for dressing, nor the bread for stilling hunger. They must bring profit. If the product, however, is only used, but not also bought, since the producer's pay is too small, were the salary raised, it wouldn't pay to produce the commodity. Why then hire the hands? For they must produce at the workbench more than a reproduction of worker and family if there's to be profit. Yet, what then with the commodities? In good logic, therefore, woolens and grain, coffee and fruits and fish and pork, all are consumed by fire to warm the god of profit. Okay, thank you, Niraj. We are uh, now moving a, on. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. I've cut it down quite a lot. <clears throat> These are Verse 383 to 402, the ruler's rule was always founded on the fact that the ruled could somehow live from the toil. Their exploitation was sure. But now the bourgeoisie can manage no more to ensure a servile life to their serfs. Instead of feeding off its proletarians, now it must feed them. It needs to employ them but has no employment for them, and yet lets their numbers swell, and dehumanization wins, marking the victims and victimizers. Chaos results from the bourgeoisie's plans. The more plans, more chaos, and lack is born from production. Wherever it rules, death dealing to the vast majority, no longer can society live under its rule. The new class, is ra it raised, the proletariat will bring it down. It raised itself, the giant hands that dig its grave. The vast majority is in this movement. And when it rules, this is no longer ruling, but suppression of rule. Only oppression shall here be oppressed. The proletarians, lowest level of society, must, in order to rise, smash into pieces the whole social structure with all its upper levels. 
the workers may break their own class chains only by breaking the chains of one and all i couldn't i end with the anti utopia i had to end with the the hope that uh, brecht and marx ends with and darko Thank, Thank you, you Niran. Right. We will be having another reading from the poem in a few minutes, but now we will hear from Christopher Winks, who has uh, uh, joined us today from uh, Queens and uh, is going to make his commentary. Go ahead, Christopher. Thank you very much, and first of all, uh, many thanks to. Uh, all of you to the Marxist Education Project, to everybody in attendance, to Michael for inviting me, and also um, for Darko Suvin and his really uh, magisterial translation of Das Manifest, Bertolt Brecht's unfinished poetic adaptation of Marx and Engels' 1848 Communist Manifesto. The drafts were done almost a uh, hundred years following the publication of that manifesto. And it's worth noting that in one of the later editions, Engels talks about all the translations of the manifesto that uh, um, were put out you know, and uh, the first one in English, I just want to give a shout out to Helen McFarlane, who was also a Hegelian, incidentally, one of the first uh, people in Britain to write commentaries on Hegel. She was the first translator of Marx's manifesto, and there were several other English translations as well. And uh, the test of any great text is that it uh, be subjected to uh, multiple translations. Indeed, there is no definitive version of this Brecht poem, as Darko says in his uh, commentary. Um, he it's I, I, I would hesitate to use the word cobbled together because, uh, you know, he did make some changes. He put from different variants and he put this uh, together um, in terms of, uh, you know, taking a line here, a line there. So it's sort of uh, as well as being a, um, a translation, it's also to some extent an original creation, as in fact, I believe all translations tend to be. Um, the transmutation by Brecht of Marx's, uh, Marx and Engels' manifesto, um, it's interesting because Sergei Eisenstein wanted to make a film of uh, Capital. He didn't do it. Uh, Alexander Kluge, um, the German filmmaker and writer and commentator, um, did a nine hour film, which to me was rather static. I lasted two hours. Um, News for Ideological Antiquity, Marx, Eisenstein, Capital. Um, so there is a process of like moving Marx and Engels, moving the manifesto into uh, different media, into different forms. Of course, as you, as Darko has pointed out, uh, the Brecht poem is, um, in hexameters, um, Latin hexameters, which I think lends a properly epic dimension to it. It is explicitly a, a Lehrgedicht, um, just like a, a poem for teaching, a didactic poem, um, much as some of his plays are the Lehrstücke, the, uh, you know, plays that, you know, teach a lesson, right? I won't say preach a lesson, teach a lesson. Um, this particular adaptation was inspired by Brecht's ongoing discussions with the uh, heterodox Marxist theoretician Karl Korsch. Um, and uh, Korsch, in many respects, was uh, um, Brecht's teacher. Uh, he acknowledged Korsch as such, and uh, he wrote an affectionate yet not entirely uncritical poem about uh, Korsch, who, you know, if any of you have read Marxism and philosophy and his study on Karl Marx was, uh, you know, very thorough critic of second international um, pseudo-socialism and uh, also of Leninism. So uh, it's very interesting to, you know, think of Brecht as in, con as in pretty regular conversation with Korsch. Now, um, one of the most interesting commentators on Brecht is uh, Walter Benjamin. And uh, um, 
in preparation for this presentation, I looked at his conversations with Brecht, which are from his diary, and they're from 1934 and 1938, when both were in uh, Norway. And you can find these in uh, um, Understanding Brecht, a collection of uh, Benjamin's writings on Brecht. And uh, there are several points that are made here. Um, because Benjamin also, as you know, was uh, somewhat of a heterodox Marxist, and uh, um, which I think is the only way to be, but uh, that's my thing. Um, uh, he already in 1934, Brecht was contemplating doing um, a didactic poem, and uh, um, he's Benjamin writes, in the course of the conversation, I tried to explain to Brecht that such a poem would not have to seek approval from a bourgeois public, but from a proletarian one, which presumably would find its criteria less in Brecht's earlier, partly bourgeois-oriented work than in the dogmatic and theoretical content of the didactic poem itself. If this didactic poem succeeds in enlisting the and enlisting the authority of Marxism on its behalf, I told him, then your earlier work is not likely to weaken that authority. Um, I think that's a very uh, valuable comment. Um, Brecht in his conversations uh, it shows himself to be a very harsh critic of what really existing in parentheses Stalinist socialism is. There's a very funny moment where uh, um, he says, uh, and according to Benjamin, he hints that those who have appropriated the theoretical doctrines of Marx and taken over their management will always form a clerical camarilla. Marxism lends itself all too easily to interpretation. Today it is a hundred years old, and what do we find? At this point, the conversation was interrupted. The state must wither away. Who says that? The state. Here he can only mean the Soviet Union. He assumes a cunning, furtive expression, puts himself in front of the chair in which I am sitting, he is impersonating the state, and says with a sly, sidelong glance, very Brechtian, at an imaginary interlocutor, I know I ought to wither away. <laughs> um, so, you know, you can see that Brecht is turning all these ideas around in his mind. Um, and some of that is certainly there in this 1945 uh, manifesto, because you will notice as you read it, there is no mention of any vanguard party. There is no mention of any really existing socialism. The conclusion of the poem, which to my mind, the beginning and the end are the strongest uh, elements, the uh, part that Pratius read about the specter of communism. In a way, this is an expansion of Marx's, uh, um, Marx and Engels's manifesto. And as such, it's, uh, you know, it stands or falls sometimes on its uh, um, merits and its applicability. I mean, and uh, I think that uh, um, Following the Brechtian maxim, which concludes Benjamin's conversations, don't start from the good old things, but the bad new ones. So from the bad perspective of the bad new ones, I just wanted to offer in conclusion a couple of critical remarks about uh, Brecht's manifest. Um, in a sense, what uh, shortcomings we can find in the original text by Marx and Engels are the shortcomings of their historical moment. Um, the praise of the bourgeoisie, for example, um, and its ability to knock down all Chinese walls. You probably all know this um, by heart. But I think in the, although he, Brecht definitely uh, denounces the war makers, and he has some very eloquent words in his discussions with uh, um, Benjamin about this. Um, there is still a kind of hymning of the praise of the uh, bourgeoisie, which tends to eliminate certain factors in the rise to power of this bourgeoisie internationally. Africa, for instance, is only mentioned as ships going around Africa. You know, there is nothing about colonialism. There is nothing about the transatlantic slave trade, which really built the bourgeoisie in Europe. Um, there is, uh, you know, and to that extent, I think that uh, it's uh, 
it's less of an excusable shortcoming, right? But this also um, tends to uh, underscore the basic Eurocentrism of much of Marxist uh, of, mu of much of Marxist thought. And uh, as Franz Fanon said, um, Marxism Marxist theory always needs, and I'm paraphrasing here, to be somewhat stretched when talking about the colonial problem. And I think that stretching is a task of the uh, um, the bad new days too, as well the ecological concerns. Um, you know, I just remember Brecht say it's a crime to write about trees, you know, in certain times. Well, right now it is not a crime to write about trees in a period of massive deforestation. So <laughs> that's one way in which we need to correct the fact that the bourgeoisie may have had a dynamic role, but it has also had a profoundly destructive role on the uh, on the environment and uh, on the world. And I think now we can step back and see that it doesn't deserve that kind of praise. I wanted to conclude by uh, um, pointing out again the importance of the very ending, which is... Uh, um, you know, in a way, you sort of see uh, the uh, um, fumbling around here because I have Xerox copy. Yes, here. Um, talking about the, I think, uh, uh, the proletariat will bring it down. It raised itself the great giant hands that dig its grave, namely the bourgeoisie. The vast majority is in this movement, and when it rules, this is no longer ruling, but suppression of rule. Only oppression shall here be oppressed. The proletarians, lowest level of society, must, in order to rise, smash into pieces the whole social structure with all its upper levels. No longer ruling, but suppression of rule. Now, several years after this, Brecht would write a pay into Lysenkoism. So you see, it's a, <laughs> the, the growing of millet. It was, so, you know, Brecht himself is uh, sometimes very slippery on these things. But in 1945, at the end of the war, you know, there was this, he, he was uh, clearly showing that, you know, what we need when we write this kind of poem and we have it as a didactic purpose is for the um, workers to relearn, in fact, their position and to reapply the uh, ultimate lesson of Marx, right? Which uh, this is almost borrowed from the uh, civil war in France that, uh, you know, that you can't just simply lay hold of the state and use it for your own purpose. You have to destroy it. In the last two lines, how may the workers break their own class chains? only by breaking everybody's chains. So with that, you know, wonderful conclusion, I will cease and uh, I thank you for your attention. And I am now gonna um, introduce uh, Paget Henry, who is somebody whose work I've been reading for many, many years. I particularly wanna point out uh, his uh, book, Caliban's Reason, which is one of the most important uh, philosophical texts um, of the past uh, several decades. He is a longtime scholar, a longtime activist, and, uh, you know, he, he's somebody I, I, I have only, you know, I have only the utmost respect for. And, uh, you know, I am now going to, you know, turn the floor, you know, gratefully and humbly over to him. And again, I thank you for your attention. Well, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful and warm uh, introduction. And uh, my thanks to uh, Michael Laudner and all of the others uh, who have put this uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, occasion together. Uh, and I feel very honored to have been invited uh, to participate uh, <clears throat> In this, in this event. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, our thanks must go to Darko Suvin for creating really uh, the work that is uh, bringing us uh, uh, here, uh, together here today. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful thing to do. Uh, great job. 
and uh, the, the work uh, just made me, and I think it should make all of us, uh, really rethink in subtle and creative ways the nature of poetry and its relations to the poet uh, and to the society uh, of the poet. Uh, in, 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 in doing this work, uh, uh, Brecht and Suvin uh, together uh, has forced us to constantly rethink the relationships between poetry uh, and its context, such as the relationship between poetry and subjectivity, poetry and politics, the methods of political communication. One of the advantages of a pamphlet over poetry or poetry over the novel or a book or a lecture that uh, Suvin's discussion, uh, you know, of Brecht's wrestling with a poem, a poem or a pamphlet, I thought it was very revealing, at least certainly made me think about our struggles uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, and then of course, the relationship between poetry and social classes, and of course, between poetry and uh, societal development, the movement of history. Uh, in particular, various stages uh, in the development uh, of capitalism. So I'm gonna be brief. If we divide the history of capitalism into the phases of its liberal competitive era, uh, its advanced monopoly uh, phase, the current and declining neoliberal phase, and what appears to be the emerging informatic or techno super hyper, you know, techno thing phase, uh, <clears throat> you know, Suvin's translation and his comments uh, on, the tra uh, on Brecht's work, again, helps us to understand the changing relationships between these phases in the development of capitalism, I should say Western capitalism, and the creative codes of poetic composition. Uh, the way in which he got into you know, uh, some of the more technical issues, you know, uh, <clears throat> the rhythmic, the rhythms of, po of poetic composition, the sonic uh, aspects of poetic composition, and the new vocabularies of capitalism as it goes through. Uh, its various phases, those I found very informative and of course made me think of issues that as a non-poet, I really had not thought about before. So, uh, so Suvin, thanks, thanks for expanding my horizons in this very specific uh, and, and concrete way. So setting uh, this view uh, of poetry and, 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 the, and, the, and the changing stages or phases, I should say, of, of Western capitalism, uh, setting them against your excellent discussion of utopia, anti-utopia, and dystopia, to me, opened up uh, just some new vistas for exploring Again, the relationships between uh, poetry uh, and the changing and, 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 and capitalism. It's, it really made me think about our poets in the Caribbean, uh, our poets particularly of the 1940s, uh, trying to grapple with the colonial face of Western capitalism. In particular, I thought about the struggles and the tensions between the negritude poets and the non-negritude poets. 
uh, and how all of this intersected with Marxism uh, in, 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 in the Caribbean uh, in the 1940s. And of course, the, the, the sort of the peak of all of this was the tension between Amy Césaire and René Menel uh, to the point where the, 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 the difficulty of grappling with these relations led to this historic split between Menil, uh, who was sort of more of, a, well, you could say, a Stalinist Marxist, uh, and, and, and Césaire, who was much more uh, of a Pan-Africanist, bringing in a lot of the specifically black and racial issues uh, and Menil arguing that the way you are bringing these things in, uh, Amy, you are disrupting poetic form. And so there was this great debate between, you know, how do you integrate the politics of race into the composition of poetry without, you know, just totally disrupting, disregarding uh, poetic form. And of course, the poetic forms that they were really engaged in at the time was, of course, surrealism. That in terms of poetry, the surrealist movement had come to really, really engage uh, French Caribbean uh, uh, poets. So to be able to think all of this anew uh, is what uh, this work uh, did for me. And so as I was reading it, I, I really was just having so much fun. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process of writing a paper on Rene Menel. And trust me, this paper is now going to be very different. So I, I think I've used up my five to eight minutes. So I'll stop there and I look forward to just being a part of this wonderful, wonderful moment. Thank you, Michael, for the invitation. Thank you, Patrick. Now, we will hear some of the trans Darko's translation again, Bill Henning, who goes to the very beginning of our Marxist education project when it formed back in the early 70s in response to the austerity capital put to the workers of New York City, is here after years of organizing workers in the New York area to read from Darko's translation of Bertolt Brecht's Communist Manifesto. Bill, the floor is yours. And after that, we will have a few minutes of discussion. Go ahead, Bill. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to the MEP. It's, a, it's an honor to be with all these uh, scholars and thinkers and doers uh, around the world. Um, you know, some motivational speaker once said, repetition is the mother of learning, the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. So some of this is going to sound familiar to you, but I think you'll bear with me. Wars are destroying the world, and the ruins are visibly haunted by an enormous specter, not simply born of war. In peace, it could already be cited, terror to the rulers, but friend to the children of slums. In scanty kitchens, often it peeps, horrified, angry, into the half-empty pots. Often it waits for the exhausted in front of shipyards and mines. It visits friends in jails, passing without passport. Even in offices it may be seen and in lecture rooms heard. At times it dons a hat of steel, enters huge tanks and flies with deadly bombers. It speaks in many tongues, in all of them, and in many it holds its tongue. It sits as a guest of honor in hovels, a headache of villas. It has come to change all things and stay forever. Its name is communism. For deeper and longer lasting than the wars our primers render are the wars of classes, open or secret. Not for enemy cities, but for their own, ending only in revolution or in a joint downfall of the fighters, rulers, and ruled. But liberty, equality, fraternity, what happened to it? Freedom for the bourgeois to exploit people, say the classics, 
equality before the rich, I'm sorry, equality before the law for the rich and poor to buy palaces or to be permitted to sleep under the bridge arches. Colossal crises recurring in cycles, similar to huge and blindly groping hands that grip and throttle commerce, convulse in speechless rage, companies, markets, and homes. Immemorial hunger had plagued the world when granaries emptied. Now, nobody knows why. We're hungry when they're too full. Mothers find nothing in the bare pantry to fill the small mouths, while sky-high mountains of grain rot behind walls. And while bales upon bales of cloth are warehoused, the ragged family, overnight kicked out of its rented home, wanders freezing through emptied city quarters. He who cursed exploiters now cannot find exploiters. Ceaseless was his work. Ceaseless is now his search for work. But the gate is locked. Alas, even hell functions no longer. Where now? The giant edifice of civil society built with so much exertion by so many sacrificed generations sinks back into barbarism. Not the too little is threatening. The too much makes it totter. The house does not exist for dwelling, the cloth for dressing, nor the bread for stilling hunger. They must bring profit. If the product, however, is only used, but not also bought, since the producer's pay is too small, were the salary raised, it wouldn't pay to produce the commodity. Why then hire the hands? For they must produce at the workbench more than a reproduction of worker and family, if there's to be profit. Yet what then with the commodities? In good logic, therefore, woolens and grain, coffee and fruits and fish and pork, all are consumed by fire to warm the God of profit. Heaps of machines, tools for entire armies of workers, blast furnace, shipyard and mine and iron and textile mill, all sacrificed, cut up to appease the God of profit. Yet their God of profit is smitten with blindness. He never sees the victims. He's ignorant. While he advises believers, he mumbles formulas nobody grasps. The laws of economics are revealed as the law of gravity at the time the house collapses, crashing on our heads. In panic, torment the bourgeoisie, starts cutting to pieces its goods, and wildly runs with the remains around the world, searching for newer and larger markets. The plague-stricken thus flees, but only carries the plague along and infects the places of shelter. In new and larger crises, it wakes up staggered. But upon the impoverished people whose multitudes the bourgeoisie is whirling around in planless plans, now thrown into saunas, now onto icy streets again, it dawns that the springtime of the bourgeois class is over. Its constricting world can't grasp the riches created. Mountains of machinery behind fences and walls and hidden even better by laws. And on this side, millions upon millions of willing workers terribly torn away from the means of working by fences and walls and the state's laws. Each a singleton that may be hired by the hour to set in motion the machines, hired like water power or electricity for the cost of production. But only if that blind god of profit, the crazy one, nods the gambler. The ruler's rule was always founded on the fact that the ruled could somehow live from the toil. Their exploitation was sure. But now the bourgeoisie can manage no more to ensure a servile life to their serfs. Instead of feeding off its proletarians, now it must feed them. It needs to employ them but has no employment for them and yet lets their numbers swell. And dehumanization wins, marking the victims and victimizers. Chaos results from the bourgeoisie's plans. The more plans, more chaos. And lack is born from production. Whatever it rules, death dealing to the vast majority. No longer can society live under its rule. The new class it raised, the proletariat, will bring it down. It raised itself, 
the giant hands that dig its grave. The vast majority is in this movement, and when it rules, this is no longer ruling but suppression of rule. Only oppression shall here be oppressed. The proletarians' lowest level of society must, in order to rise, smash into pieces the whole social structure with all its upper levels. The workers may break their own class chains only by breaking the chains of one and all. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. So we have a few minutes for discussion. Uh, so either raise your hand in the your uh, your uh, Zoom rectangle or write the word stack in chat and you'll be called on in sequence. So, uh, Paget, you have raised your hand. Go ahead. Yes, and no, I uh, just wanted to really uh say you know what 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 this means for capitalism and poetry today and uh for me uh you know the the rise of the neoliberal era and the fact that in the neoliberal era it's as though poetry was replaced by uh, po uh, poetic deconstruction, that the rise of post-structuralism and the deconstructive use of poetry, the relationship between uh, poetry, I should say poetics, not poetry, but poetics, and it, it, it's, its critique of, of classic Western rationality, uh, <clears throat> And how that came to dominate the academy uh, is, I think, an interesting extension, uh, if I understand uh, Suvin's analysis uh, it correctly. And uh, so it really helped me to understand the popularity of, uh, you know, poetic uh, deconstruction and the role of poetics in uh, the popularity of, 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 of the whole deconstructive turn uh, throughout the, the phase of, 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 of neoliberalism. I think that the decline of neoliberalism is also the, the decline of this post-structuralist appropriation of poetics. And so we have to look forward now to this super high-tech, computer-driven, I call it informatic capitalism that we are confronted with. And so what, what is poetry going to be like uh, in this coming era? So these are just some thoughts uh, I had. And so I'll just throw them out, uh, you know, and, and, and see you know, what, what they add uh, to, to our coming together. Thank you, uh, Padgett. Um, would you have anything to say to that, Darko, at this moment? Uh, first of all, my image has frozen. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. you are very Okay, clear. I apologize. I fiddled with the camera and now it's frozen anyway. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to say at the beginning that I'm very grateful. I shan't uh, repeat all of your names, but to all the readers and the people who intervened here, uh, and especially, of course, to people who helped to bring the book out, uh, Pratyush and uh, my ex-students, uh, Niraj and Javed Malik. Um, I am very happy at uh, this discussion because it brings us 
uh, obviously one could go on uh, an awful lot, but I don't think this is the place for it about poetry and what I call poetry and doctrine. Um, but I would like to talk only about why we are, we are here to discuss it. It is because we feel a need for orientation. It is because of what Paget Henry calls a new phase. Uh, I would call it something like uh, the new surveillance society, which then obviously uses computers uh, and Silicon Valley as its, as its basic props. Um, we are, in my opinion, and I'm getting into the second part of our discussion here, but maybe this is good. We are at a cusp. We have been at a cusp since roughly uh, the Twin Towers uh, and the proclamation of uh, uh, extraordinary powers, uh, anti-terrorism, uh, uh, rendition, and all of that. We are at a cusp where... Um, I think capitalism is actually mutating into something the nearest analog to which is fascism, but it's obviously not the classical fascism, but some uh, in, in, in computer lingo fascism 2.0 or maybe 3.0 or God knows what. Um, A lot of zero, say, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That <laughs> is to say a mixture of slave-owning, neo-feudal, um, and the rentier with capitalist production coming up poor and capitalist contract uh, arrangements uh, with a few favorite, um, uh, let us say, workers or employed people is an uncouth mixture, uh, best, uh, but of course quite insufficiently, um, perhaps... Uh, hinted at in Jack London's Iron Heel. Centuries of dictatorship and fight against it. Obviously, whether they will be centuries or not, we don't know. The technologies have changed, the psychology has changed, and so on. So we are at the cusp of something totally new, and the point is, what can we salvage from a very wide, deep, and important tradition of left thought. Okay, now never mind the great ancestors, Milton and Marat and all so on. Let's just uh, stop at um, people like Marx and Kropotkin and uh, a few more. Uh, certainly Lenin is there as a great ancestor to my mind, uh, if handled critically. And Brecht was facing the same problem in um, uh, 1944-45 Germany, he wrote, news from Germany terrible, the Soviet armies at the borders, no workers uprising. He thought the workers couldn't rise up because the Gestapo was terrorizing them. Now the Gestapo is at the front fighting the Soviets, why don't they rise? Obviously he was, he was misinformed and wrong. Um, how do how do I help? This was touched on by discussions. How do I help people to estrange, to defamiliarize, to verfremd the uh, Marxism, which is no longer read by the working class as a pamphlet, although it was a great poetic form in prose of its own, adds Brecht. Um, the the key. The key uh, sentence that struck me when we had those wonderful readings by Bill Henning and Neeraj too is, alas, hell works no longer. Even hell functions no longer. This is where we are at, more or less, I think. Um, obviously, what could one say about Brecht's 1944 to 51 tinkering with we could say uh, one thing I quite agree that uh, I, I wrote about this somewhere. The praise of the bourgeoisie is the praise of a um, guy from the Rhine Valley hating the Prussian king and the neo-feudal um, stupidities of the Prussian 
um, state. Uh, we are not there anymore. And what we see is not that the praise of the bourgeoisie was wrong, but it was one-sided and historically limited to the phase, let's say, in France up to 1848 and in England and in other countries up to later. And the second thing that nobody mentions here, uh, but um, I have problems to begin with poetical ones, but then also ideological ones with proletarians. Uh, I am in favor, I'm, as all good Marxists, I'm a conservative. I am in favor of conserving it, but only if one reinterprets it. In other words, Marx meant by proletarians more or less, I think, the industrial workers. This is no longer tenable. Much industry has been deconstructed. Of course, industrial workers are there in spades in China, and that's another whole huge discourse. And in the rest of Asia and in uh, the South in general. So we have to figure out uh, if we want to use this tradition, uh, what are, as Titoism had it, the working people, which I rather like as a syntagm. If you think proletarians today means working people, then I think proletarians in the Communist Manifesto can still be used. And I'll stop here with thanks to everybody. This was good to hear. Thank and of course, uh, what, you should, uh, what should be said is that there is also a whole book published by Political Animal Toronto of mine called Communism, Poetry. So if you're interested in this uh, syndrome, uh, please go and look at it. Thank you, Darko. I, I think that at this point we will move to Mary's reading and uh, to move our program along, which is looking at the, the coroniza coronization and anti-utopia. And Mary, uh, I'm calling on you. And, and I should say, Mary Boger, like Bill Henning, goes to the very beginning of what is now the Marxist Education Project. They were founders of the Marxist Education Collective nearly five years before I came to New York, but they were both engaged in the anti-austerity movement that really is what one could say is when neoliberal, uh, the neoliberal regimes of capital did their work out of how they were going to crush whatever small gains had been made. Go ahead, Mary. You need to unmute. Yes. Okay, can everybody hear me? I think I'm going to have to speed up a bit because our time is getting very um, short. I will just give the head titles and not the subtitles throughout the piece. Um, so it's anti-utopia in coronization times, some political epistemology. And well, I will just mention the name of the first section, the ruling anti-utopianism and its mutation, violence versus care. And now I will go to the text. We, that's my animals. <laughs> uh, we approach 40 years of living under the anti-utopia of a global ruling class counter project to the post-1917 welfare and warfare state, both in its Leninist and Keynesian manifestations. The new phase of capitalism is developing as an in-depth attack on life. As well as war abroad, Ever-increasing repression is utilized to quell rising despair over the sabotage of decent incomes, public health, education, housing, and all other services for people. The true owners of life today are the armed forces, pharmaceutical companies, agrochemical monsters, information profiteers, and mega banks. The COVID pandemic overlaps the two biopolitical plagues of climate disruption and global warfare, and it could be replicated by other severe pandemics. Just as water wars and masses dying from disease and undernourishment 
are all caused by capitalist interventions into the biome. The central contradiction of capital is human lives, including their necessary natural environment as against monetary profit. The contradiction is between violence and care. Finding at hand an erupting pandemic that might infect three billion people with millions of deaths, the capitalist anti-utopia is poised to reject the worn out neoliberal paradigm and bring in a different imaginary while channeling public funds to hugely enrich a small class fraction of capitalists in a variant of a world wartime economy. The unholy of Trinity, this existential anti-utopia, is one, hatred of plebeian, plebeian creativity and roaming intelligence. Two, the state as repressive violence instead of as public power. And three, annihilating warfare instead of creative emulation. I am concentrating on the second face, but all three are always implied. All our struggles to minimize the harm of a global pandemic have a chance at success only if some political and epistemological preconditions are in place. By political, I mean Marx's sense of confronting reality with a fusion of scholarly data and revolutionary values, as in the Communist Manifesto. By epistemology, I mean a renewal of key mental constructs in order to grasp our reality. Assuming that we broadly agree on the politico, ideological anti-utopia, anti I propose two more new terms to help us see the swiftly changing reality, capitalism and coronization. I'm going to give the title of the next section of the sections. Two, a little political epistemology, capital of scene, coronization, causality. The capital of scene notion and practice. How can we identify anything so that we might be understood, so it might be understood and changed? Only if we name it in a way that situates it within a web of causation. My explanatory overarching category here is the capital of zine. Some semantic hygiene is indispensable for collective sociopolitical hygiene. The term Anthropocene was popularized at the beginning of the century by atmospheric scientists as a name for our current geological epoch because human impact on ecosystems and climate is causing geological changes in decades that earlier took tens or hundreds of millennia. But is an Indian slum dweller or a landless Latin American equally responsible for the environmental impact as the ruling capitalist class? Insofar as many humans profit from the Anthropocene habitat by multiplying quicker and living longer, perhaps, but insofar as they might be decisive for the pollution of the microplastics, heavy metals, and bombs, for genocides and ecocides, no. I say for the great majority of humans, we are not guilty, but we are responsible for not ridding our species of capitalism. The term capitalocene pinpoints accurately the causal guilt for eco-destruction, which is production, consumption, and circulation of commodities by profit-driven dirty technologies, plus the power structures created by capitalists to throw back to the Stone Age those who resist. The attendant destruction of working people's health care is a secondary cause of the coronavirus pandemic. The virus of profit extraction from labor is more ancient and powerful, but it can subsume secondary viruses. Therefore, I propose to use capitalocene 
for the dominant of our times. Capital is seen is the blind, violent, and often irreversible exploitation and degradation of people and nature all over the world by capital's economic and political power. The second term to be rectified is COVID-19. Probably this name is usable in hospitals and laboratories. It's a proper brief designation for the virus agent of pandemic, but its mass aspect is not. The case fatality ratio of Corona-19 is much smaller than some previous pandemics, around 1%, though it has spiked in spots to 5 to 7% among pre-threatened populations. The World Health Organization reports 5 million dead, but the more probable number is 17 million. To date, in the U.S. plus Canada, the total deaths are circa 1 million, at least two-thirds preventable. But this virus's penetrance of the global population is unparalleled. This is in part due to the SARS-CoV-2 rapid incubation period and in part to the cap capitalist globalization and its huge and rapid movements of goods and people, usually ecologically harmful, yet profitable. Specialists who clamored for research in 2008 after the previous corona epidemic were denied funds by Big Pharma, so that in 2019, there were no medicines available for coronaviruses. Those that were quickly produced after huge giveaways by governments were denied to poorer nations, so that an eventual infection of circa 2.7 billion people, 40% of people on Earth, is quite possible. This coincides perfectly with the number of super exploited people in Capitalocene's global class warfare. In this case, 1% mortality equals 27 million dead, plus many survivors with long range physical and psychical consequences. True, these are inferences, since infectivity, virulence, or both may attenuate but they also may increase, especially if another infection were to go pandemic at the same time. In my essay, How, I discussed how the marginalized poor majority of the USA is composed of those discriminated against by gender, ethnicity, and race, refugees and internal migrant laborers, African-American and Latino communities, the elderly, the permanently unemployed, the jailed and vagrants, plus tens of millions of the suddenly unemployed. Worldwide, the masses caught in the capitalist scene's public disinvestment from social welfare are vulnerable to political traps of co-optation, resulting in political passivity or a turn to rightist ideologies surfing on justifiable resentments. This population is also a hotbed of potential epidemic resurgence, as are the refugee camps and prisons. Brutality against this legally invisible one third or more of humankind, legally invisible one third or more of humankind is intertwined with the ruler's mindlessness of the consequences. In the USA, like other developed states, a majority of the denizens, the poor and the marginalized, are exposed to mass dying. Statistics based on income are systematically excluded by the media who organize data by age, sex, and ethnicity. Otherwise, they would reveal a negative class warfare, let the poor die. Example, 2020 epidemic in New York City centered in the Bronx, parts of Queens and Staten Island. The average income of 1.4 million Bronx residents is 21,000, but that of 1.6 million in Manhattan, 111,000 $111, dollars. The ratio of Bronx dead per 100,000 of population is nearly double that of Manhattan. The global unfolding of this capitalizing trauma 
is compounded in major states by de devastated public health facilities and by lack of global coordination, plus government dawdling in order not to antagonize profit takers. The economic consequences are huge. First, this is one of the largest capitalist restructuring depressions, annihilating huge chunks of small and medium-sized business. But the wealth of the 2,189 U.S. billionaires increased by 27.5% between April and July of 2020, with a record high increase of over $10 trillion. In the first year of the pandemic, the economic cost of the transfer of U.S. federal government stimulus to big capital alone will likely be found to surpass the cost of World War II. The overarching social uses of this pandemic has to do with which classes will bear the costs and which will have profits soar. The compartmentalized term COVID-19 pandemic suggests that the people who are mainly dying of and paying for the disease should not question how these costs are being borne. The term enlists the authority of natural science to silence the overwhelming plebeian majority. Therefore, I propose we use the term coronization. This suggests that our plight is not simply the domain of medical lingo, that it is not the result of somebody's activity, that it is, pun intended, the crown of some foregoing state or stance. Coronization means an infectious virus meets social Darwinism. The cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's agribusiness, stupid. <laughs> Rob Wallace's important 2016 book, Big Farms Make Big Flu, unmentioned in most of the zillion articles since 2020, provides the only causal theory extent of, inter of interconnection between agribusiness and epidemic dangers. Quote, there are no capital-free pathogens at this point, unquote. The deforestation of huge tracts of land leads to previously boxed in pathogens spilling over into local livestock and human communities, and ultimately into the global community, migrational and tourist networks. Viruses encounter monogenetic cattle or birds packed together, and finally dense human populations, so that increased virulence becomes an evolutionary advantage. This quote offers the exact means by which pathogens can evolve the most virulent and infectious phenotypes. You couldn't design a better system to breed deadly diseases, unquote. Coronization and the surveillance society, life and liberty versus capitalism and its state. We must carefully consider the state's role concerning the national and international economies of health. The gigantic failure of auster austerity health care, leading to shoddy care for the masses of people, as opposed to excellent private medicine for the rich, is obvious. It seems clear that a system of multiple institutions for the well-being of all people, underwritten by the national and international community is indispensable. It is a clear case for global communism. Successes of state centralization, such as keeping a pandemic in bounds, should not lead us to cheer on the ruler's power, and most of them, a dictatorship of capitalist interests obtains. Key to the politics of such demands, as we must make up a state, is never trusting the state of which we make them. The present discourse pivots on scientism in its medical variant, inevitable progress from the virus peril to the triumphant salvation by vaccine, and in between recourse to military discourse necessary to control and confine people. Such control can be manipulated by the ruling classes to create, create a state of siege for billions of people, but not for their sources of profit. 
it is it easily turns into a sanitary leviathan, melding benevolent and malefic, ben, ben, melding beneficent and malefic, malefic, I'm sorry, um, maleficent state intervention with hyper surveillance. We see our rulers rushing towards a complete surveillance state. The only answer to that is pressing from below a strong plebeian democracy, including free access to mass media for citizen groups and democrat democratic vigilance, including careful monitoring of surveillance in health services and association of producers, medical practitioners and producers of medications and equipment and consumers, patients. My consumer, quote, my consumers, are they not my producers? Asked James Joyce. To technological militarization, working people must oppose the horizon of solidarity, plebeian power, and red, green, new deal. Four, radical utopianism, utopianism, the only chance to fight anti-utopia. To revolt with critical utopianism is healthy. A precondition for opposing this looming tyranny is a confluence of plebeian and utopian energies. Working people might begin to claim power for themselves. In the USA, there were widespread protests against racism and demands for the equipment and sanitary conditions essential workers need to stay safe. Some examples I found up to August 2020. New York teachers and Philadelphia librarians forced their systems to shut down. Detroit bus drivers and riders won free fares and safety of the drivers. Auto workers have launched wildcat strikes to stop production completely while maintaining full wages. Shop floor action forced Amazon warehouses to accept social distancing. Verizon and McDonald's workers at some locations secured paid sick leave. Housing movement activists have won moratoriums on evictions and or utility shutoffs from New York City to San Francisco. In India, South Africa, and many Latin American countries, there have been food riots. However, the protests up to now are certainly insufficient. The degradation of social democratic parties and labor unions in the 1980s accomplished what fascism bloodily enforced in the 1920s and 30s. It leaves the masses defenseless. To rearm them, we need to harness the energies of a properly understood critical utopianism like that of Kropotkin, Lenin, and Ernst Bloch as a counter to existential anti-utopia. We can begin with the realization that capitalism exists only by means of ceaseless and pitiless accumulation. This is clearly described in volume one of Marx's Capital and summarized by Rosa Luxemburg, quote, the accumulation of capital employs violence as a permanent weapon, unquote. It is invariably accompanied by militarism and by the eradication of rural industries in favor of sharp rural urban divide called industrialization hugely productive, capitalism centrally produces destruction. It undermines the springs of all wealth, the earth and the worker by practicing system, oh, let me just say, as Marx, quote, uh, Marx says in the Capital, it, quote, undermines the springs of all wealth, the earth and the worker by practicing systematic robbery of the preconditions for life of space, air, light, unquote. Today, we could add water, silence, etc., culminating in the theft of breath itself, epitomized both by coronization and the suffocation of George Floyd by the police. Death is the final horizon for a civilization of worldwide endless wars and raping of the planet by exploitation of working people and ecocide. This is all embracing anti-utopia. This all embracing anti-utopia should be called the capitalocene, of which coronization is a part and perhaps a decisive turn of the screw. 
It threatens humanity, both as a species and as a quality distinct from animality. Anti-fascism as the only alternative. Dismantling, dismantling structural capitalism may today look highly unrealistic, but what happens if and when we are faced by mass dying and total surveillance and a total surveillance state? Mass dying fo follows not only upon coronization, but also mass hunger and other diseases. Then the enormous climate destruction upheavals to come. A total surveillance state comes as near to fascism as no matter. It all depends on people understanding and their will to associate in struggle. It all depends on people understanding and their will to associate in struggle. The underlying preconditions of a potential radical yearning can be found in many places, but I have seen them foregrounded only in a remarkable April UK study in which only 9% of those questions wanted a return to normality before the pandemic, while 85% would like to keep some of the changes of lockdown, the lockdown time, cleaner air, presence of more wildlife, less waste in preparing food, also more contact with family and friends and a growing sense of local community. We should steal Mrs. Thatcher's stolen slogan back and proclaim, there is no alternative. Thank you, Darko. Thank you, Mary. Nail on the head. Thank you, thank you, Mary. Darko, I, you have a, a piece you want to read. I think that with our time, maybe you do that now before we have a discussion, or do you want to do discussion now? You mean the poem? The, the well, let's, let, well, I think we should do our, we'll do the poem at the end if we have time. Let's uh, have I, our discussion. No, 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 I, 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 I want I the discussion. Can, let's can do I, our, everybody. There's a, question in the, there's a question in the chat, too, that uh, was posted uh, yes. a while ago. So Yes, yes, yes. I saw that. I'll go. To, that was John Woodward, whose microphone is not working. His question is, I feel in Brecht an anger at lack of agency of the proletariat, and that that lack of agency will lead them to rise up. But this new phase of capitalism is rooted in a strong fictional agency, online money-making schemes, YouTube, influencers, etc. How can we translate the question of agency for a new proletariat that believes it has some agency now? That is the question of John Woodward. I wish I had an answer I would tell you immediately. We need another program just on that. <laughs> yes, I think that's correct. So I'm looking for people writing stack or raising their hands to ask questions. Herb Michael, you are up. Yeah, I'm sorry I came in late. Uh, I was out. Um, I did watch some, listen to some of what was said. Um, I, I, I'm always, I, I don't quite understand. I mean, clearly, uh, it's his, and historically, if you wanted to supplant capitalism with something else, you need to organize a, a, a movement that's open as well as underground simultaneously that proposes that and proposes it to, despite it at the moment, not being what people see as necessary. And I, I, I don't need, know how to be any clearer than to say that 
if what you want to supplant is capitalism, you need to fight for a communist society, and therefore you need a revolutionary communist movement that's going to set out to do that, and that is not always uh, something that happens quickly. And, uh, and, um, but that is what history teaches us is necessary, whether it's the Russian experience or the Chinese experience or, and uh, a number of other experiences in between. What usually does happen, though, is that liberal ideas are used to lead the movement, and the movement doesn't take a hold. The movement towards replacing capitalism doesn't take a hold uh, within the working classes and the peasantry. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's always important to direct the conversation back to uh, egalitarian communism and... Um, and the need for a movement to create it uh, and uh, accept the fact that at first it's not going to be popular. When has it been? Can I just comment very briefly? I wanted go, to use, Go ahead, Chris. Yes. Yeah, very, very briefly, um, in which case I would uh, cite CLR James's uh, observation of what counts as what's happening every day. You know, and that uh, it's on the basis of, you know, the everyday struggles that something could perhaps coalesce because you can't bring egalitarian communism, you know, by fiat, right? Or, you know, to kind of like say, this is what people are striving for. You know, I think Marx said, Marx and Engels said in the Holy Family, we don't say cease your struggles, they are stupid stuff. You know, they say that uh, what matters is uh, what the proletariat is and what it's capable of. And uh, that uh, if you take the Jamesian approach of looking for what is going on on a daily basis, then perhaps it might be a way towards a more, um, you know, utopian way of uh, thinking and uh, of uh, acting, right? Uh, you know, what, what, what I would call the, what Bloch called the, uh, you know, to think, you know, of utopia in a non-utopian way, you know, to see that as it can be achieved rather than, you know, somewhere out there. I just wanted to add to what, uh, you know, to Herb's very cogent comment. Darko, do you have anything to say at this moment? No, but I see seven chats announced on my ah. monitor. I don't know what that means. I see chat number seven. I don't, I'm not getting them. Um, the word stack, I am not getting the word stack in chat. That's there are chats that people are having, but that is different than... Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Well, I, I... My idea was to lead to this discussion. I am no more capable than anybody else of saying how to proceed, and I'm certainly not capable of saying anything about North America where I don't live for the last 22 years. Uh, so uh, the only thing I can say is that it seems to me um, our sense of urgency should be our, by our I mean to create a mass sense of urgency seems to me the next goal, how and where and in what ways I cannot say. Uh, but I think the next generation of uh, cellular phones is going to have hard baked by Silicon Valley in agreement, probably it's already being sold, in agreement with the government, um, a, um, uh, an electronic gadget which gives an account of any other cellular phone within a meter and a half of you. This is supposed to prevent people um, from uh, 
corona infection. But it's obviously going to be hard baked. There is no uh, choice about it. And it's obviously going to have to be used. It obviously will be used by all the police forces and uh, uh, surveillance ad agencies that exist. So, you know, we are... Um, H.G. Wells put it once we are in a race between education and survival. It's a bit wishy-washy as Wells and most Fabians used to be, but I think he was getting at something very important. Mary Boger, you are on. Uh, yes, picking up on one thing, though, that Darko, you mentioned, you know, it's about understanding the causes. And one of the tasks, one of the real problems we have now, is, I would say internationally, is that the working class doesn't know itself as a connected uh, uh, body that has the real knowledge and power as a class, but not individually. So the, instead of, I mean, like take a cell phone, a cell phone, uh, they're wonderful. The British did a wonderful thing. It's 150 different countries and workers in different countries doing different parts of the cell phone that we all over the world now, everywhere have. But workers who make it, I mean, there's a, the children in the Congo that go into the mines and die young. You know, it's, it's, but it's all kinds of people from almost across the globe. Nobody knows it. It isn't a common knowledge that I'm involved in a process with others that is a species process, not a national process. And they are dependent on the capitalist for making a profit so that they can be can have a job. So we're dealing with a tremendous, really the fetishism of commodities that Marx is talking about, that even if once you know it, it disappears in the act of everyday life. And for working people, I come from the working class, I'm in a working class neighborhood in the Bronx, and all of them want them the capital to work for the most part, because that means I'll have a job but they're not even located in a factory system where they combine together with each other. So they're selling themselves even more individually. So there's, and, and as you bring up in your, your uh, paper on anti-utopia, that, you know, with 75, the destruction of the unions and the new phase of rentier capital that comes into place, you know, and the, the breakdown of uh, the, the pro proletariat from their own concrete connection with other workers because of the new technologies. And it's even more now than ever, so you're dealing with rentier finance, fictitious capital ruling the game, uh, which can only lead to the kinds of things that you're describing. The question of subjectivity of each and every individual proletariat has got to be addressed by us. And how do we go about creating an international dialogue for that process to happen? Because here in the States, uh, we're moving, a lot of the proletariat is going to be won over to anti-immigrant, anti all kinds of stuff more than ever. And, and, uh, and most of the violence now is internal within the class itself against itself, not towards the, towards the, um, uh, the ruling class. It's criminality, it's abuse, oh, it's children shooting children in the Bronx, you know, 15 year olds with guns, and a kid comes out of school and shoots them. I mean, this isn't, this is regular, it's not exceptional now. We're in, a, the class is really in a, an, an internal, a dangerous zone in relationship to itself. So I think this problem, we have to problematize this. We have to do the kind of thing you're saying in your, your paper and really, and get an understanding and take on that challenge of, of the subjectivity of class consciousness. And how do we meet these challenges that capital now has brought about? And recognize that in other class societies like feudalism, most cl uh, the, of the oppressed don't make revolution off and on, they might rebel because they feel an injustice is done against them, like the serfs, but they weren't trying to get rid of the feudal lord. They want to mod make them behave better, you know, and it's the same for our society, especially when it's, when it's so fetishized. You don't even see the exploitation. You're all getting paid a fair day, you know, you're, you're all getting paid for what you do. You know, so it's a really, um, I think we have to take that, that challenge on as we deal with the realities of how this new form of capitalism at this stage is, is, is being expressed. And then the question of the subjectivity of, and I say the class, but I mean individually as well, because it, it's all individuals that make up the class. And we're, we're not in a good place in regard to that, that challenge. Uh, and we've got to make the international connection. So 
Uh, Chris, you were raising your hand when Mary was raised, a second after Mary raised hers. Do you still have Well, I think she kind of, uh, you know, oh. moved the discussion in a very interesting place. And uh, um, I don't want to add anything. I don't want to add anything further at this point. Just kind of let her remarks, uh, you know, linger a little bit uh, because, uh, yeah, I mean, the... Uh, <laughs> Um, if you, for instance, talk to anybody about, I'll just say this as a kind of an add on. If you tell anybody, you know, like who has their cell phone, you know, about uh, coltan and uh, cobalt and all that, they think you're trying to guilt trip them. You know, <laughs> if you remind them of the circumstances through which the stuff is mined, I said, well, you know, well, I can't do anything about that. And we're going to see. You saw the recent series on cobalt um, mining in uh, the Congo, which is going to help the Green New Deal, right, we'll for back. electric cars and all that kind of thing. And it's like, well, that is not either, you know, but it's very hard to talk to people about the actual material conditions in which their goodies are produced, or for that matter, to talk about how much uh, power is being used by your average uh, Zoom meeting, right? In terms of, uh, <laughs> or streaming films, or streaming YouTube. You know, if you talk about that, you say, well, you know, well, you're just trying to guilt trip me. Um, so there, ha but there has to be a way of talking about this. That's all I'll say here. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, Neboisa, is that close? Yes, yes, thank you. It's Neboisa. Yes, thank you. Okay. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to discuss um, Professor Suin's uh, latest work. I had the pleasure to read the first part and uh, the poem, uh, the translation of uh, Brecht's point to the half. Uh, so I just uh, want to present maybe a possible, let's say, topic for something that we call in a reading group in which uh, professor participated kindly once last year. We have a reading group called uh, It Is Not Dead Stone, Sisyphus. And we exactly discuss, we read dystopian, as we call it, or at least till uh, this uh, important division of anti-utopia and dystopia we, we, we used to call uh, novels like uh, Men from Under, Underground Men, uh, v by Zamyatin, Huxley's uh, Brand New World, and uh, uh, Fahrenheit um, uh, by Ray Bradbury, etc. We are now going into Orwell. What we, what we uh, uh, try to uh, uh, um, analyze is which utopias are, are reflected to or criticized by the narratives of so-called dystopian novels as we uh, uh, designated them so far. And um, like the common, the common topic of this mentioned the novels is uh, resistance to planned society uh, due to the uh, possibly terrible dystopian, even anti-utopian consequences of uh, rule in such society. On the other hand, uh, there are some uh, wild, unorganized, uh, uh, terribly uh, uh, backward uh, resistance that in fact, sums up the, the message of uh, the most of authors that I mentioned to some sort of idealization of status quo. From that point, uh, uh, I think that we should discuss uh, 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 which utopias, anti-utopias and, uh, uh, and um, dystopias we, we discuss. I think that in, in present society, we, we, we see huge division uh, pro-vax, to say, movement and anti-vaxxer movement, they both claim that the opposing side is on the side of dystopian concepts. They both claim, I mean, we, pro-vaxxing side, they are claiming that they're dystopian, uh, anti-enlightenment, uh, you know, non-solidar, etc., etc., not uh, educated, um, uh, regressive, conservative, but this is pretty much what they say about us, you know, that we are into this control, uh, we are delivering the power to the state that is super problematic, etc., etc. I think that, like, what we, the problem is that utopias, anti-utopias and dystopias coexist, and they need, they cannot be discussed in the same language. And this is why I think that the attempt to, to, to transfer 
the historical uh, Marxist uh, uh, analysis uh, through Brechtian uh, uh, poetization and aesthetization to, to today's language is super important because this is some sort of a, a universal language that could, uh, that could mark what, what we were calling on the group the, uh, um, um, uh, the uh, imagine, uh, like imag imaginary horizon of society, alternative imaginary horizon. Because society, if society cannot articulate the difference, the difference, well, then it is, it is in vain because part of the mid global middle class, as Piketty pointed out, lives in utopia. They live in utopia. They, they procreate like a feudal nobility. If, if you're born in upper middle class everywhere in the world, you will be upper middle class. And if you're born in working, uh, working class, you will be exposed to education, which somebody mentioned, that in some uh, journal of uh, uh, university professors, middle school professors in England, is described through title, working class kids, permanent underachievement. I mean, in this type of education, we are not going to include all this now, only now appear masses of people that deny, reject any contact with what we call the legacy of uh, uh, enlightenment and rational organization of society to the extent that we, the state is capable for. And to end up, I think that as a, as a moment of utopian hope, as of a hope, I would single out the unique capacity of uh, uh, contemporary uh, 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 information technology to calculate entire world economy. This is the first time in history that has happened. That has happened. And what Christopher uh, ended up with, that we cannot know how this uh, uh, conversation uh, influences climate, you know, uh, rights of uh, minors in Africa. Said, we can. If we want, we can have it now in this screen, how much energy we spend, how much this will take. And this is first time in history. If you remember uh, the most serious and analyticians of Soviet economy, uh, ended up with the with the with the basic problem not being able to calculate everything. Now it is possible. It is possible, but of course, the entire world bourgeoisie will oppose the capacity to to plan gradually to develop a planning of basic uh, to say uh, uh, aspects of global economy because this this will this will uh, uh, take the power from them. If everybody can, and just to, to end up with the second episode of Black Mirror, a Black Mirror serial, which strongly refers to V by Zamyatin, where in fact, the, again, the system of possible planning of uh, using the merits, uh, personal capacity to contribute to general good is exposed to shaming, to uh, vilification, to demonization, which just witnesses about the fear of ruling classes that planning of planned economy is a dead for them. This is dead end for them. And this is all today's uh, uh, like uh, ideological uh, weapons, weaponry will be uh, focused to capacity and possibility of uh, universal uh, planned economy. And uh, if you follow any debate in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, internet, the, the grassroots fears of, of bourgeoisie is uh, somehow uh, uh, in a perverse way, perverse way, democratized and people really react on any proposal for a planned economy as to being fascist or communist or something. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Darko, I cannot see if you are one of Yes, I'm back. Yes, I'm back. Okay. Did you want to respond? Because we have Paget and Mary would had their hands up, but I wanted to see if you had something to say before. No, I I think at this point uh, this is a, uh, the idea that I think Michael, you and I had, and then Chris and so on, is to have exactly this kind of discussion. I don't mean exactly this, but I mean this kind of discussion. Yeah. Uh, and all I can say is, uh, in order to end on a positive note, Please be good enough and uh, read my poem, which I won't do now, uh, My Lady Hope, which is at the end of the Indian book. I will and have... if anybody wants it, yeah. I, can, I can send it. I, I, I was prepared to read that. In ten, in ten minutes, in ten minutes, not yet. So, 
Padgett, you had a question, and then Mary, you had a, your hand up. Yes, I just wanted to amplify uh, something that Mary was saying, that not only do we need to work on the subjectivity uh, of, of, of the working class, but we also have to work on gaining greater control of all of this technological knowledge that is coming down the pike. So I was very heartened uh, when the new head of the Avevel CIO, I'm blanking her name, but she wants to carry out this project with MIT to create a Workers Institute of Technology. And her goal with this institute is to focus on AI and 3D printing. And I think 3D printing is something that we as, you know, <coughs> people who are interested in the proletariat uh, need to focus on because this technology can be developed in several different ways. It can be developed in a way that could return to workers' control over the means of production. Now, we know that if we leave the development of this technology to the capitalists, they'll never develop it in that direction. It will only develop in that direction if indeed we have people with a worker's perspective, right, in the process of developing this technology. So I think, you know, uh, supporting this project of a worker's institute of technology, particularly around AI and 3D printing is a very good idea. And I, I was very heartened to hear it come out of the new president uh, of the AFL-CIO. So at the same time that we really have to work on the subjectivity uh, of, of the working class, which is so fragmented uh, in, in this late period of the... Um, neoliberal era, uh, I think, you know, you know, helping, helping the class to gain some power, some control uh, in this super technological age is also a very positive strategy that we could adopt. So I just wanted to say that to reinforce some of the points that Mary, Mary was making. <clears throat> And Mary, you had your hand up uh, before I asked Darko. I, I, I want to pick up on what we're discussing now. Uh, but I want to begin by saying one of the things that came out in today's discussion about Marx and in praise of the, of the capitalist is that, and this, we, this is the reality today, we are a global species now, interconnected at the, every moment of our lives with each other. That is due to the capitalist accumulation process. That has made us so that we have science that we can know, every one of us can know and understand our world and work on the problems that arise as, we, as things change over time. We have, as a class, the ability to do all that. And I mean, when I say the working class, I want to use what I think is the original notion of the proletariat. It's all those who don't own the conditions of production. So that even includes the professionals, unless they've also been able to get stock, stocks and, own, and be owners. But all in our, as a species, the, the class, the, not the capitalist class, who owns all the conditions of life and the conditions for production to go on, but the knowledge is in all of us as a combined species, and it's global. This is what capitalism has achieved in the sense of a historical transition the possibility of a classless society. It puts that on the agenda for the first time in human history. This is the challenge. But the working class, the proletariat of all its stratas, 
from the permanently unemployed to the top of the, of the professions don't see this as a class. This is where our power is, though. And I think this is what, Darko, you're getting at. You know, when you end the one poem, my lady, in the, uh, is it the Lady Hope? You know, uh, the other one, you, know, you say, the insurgent four whales that bear the world with robust love must turn it upside down. Who are they? Women, learners, lovers, workers. It's in all of us, but we only know it together. We can't do it any other way. So we don't need the capitalist. I mean, this is, I'm just talking objectively. I'm not talking about the, the reality that we're in and if this can even happen. I'm not, a, I'm not romantic about it. We're in a dead end right now. We're in a very bad crisis. Humanity and nature and everything is in crisis. But the possibility is that we actually have the capacity to do it. How do we make that known to us all so that we can act rationally, clearly, and know what we're doing? Because it's all in us. There's, they don't have it in them. They have, they're accumulating capital. They hire the people to know all of it and do it. But it's in us. And this is where, if one would use, want to use the word hope, and if we're not directing to that, if we're not directing to making that clear to all of us globally that we can do this, we can solve it. And what the uh, uh, Nabaj, the n- n- I'm sorry, I'm not going to say your name right. Uh, the last uh, before. Uh, uh, Bush. What do you say? Tell, you're, you, we have the knowledge. We, we know, we, we know, we've already known it. We have GNPs all over the, we know our, the annual produ- wealth is produced. We know its use value. We know its value. We know, and we, can, we know what it takes to do it, the time it takes to make things and so on. We can reconfigure what we do together. We can do it. But the problem with our movement today is that this is not, we don't have any workable um, uh, 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 concrete uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, not program uh, uh, means of doing it you know solving uh, of making this p- process conscious to us as a speak it, it, within the, the proletariat at large and all the stratas of that to see that we can do it and I think <clears throat> it's a challenge for today and, and um, uh, I think we need to have discussions on this. I think, I think one of the things the MEP should be doing is starting to raise the questions around this so that we can get to a point where we could really talk about transition. Uh, we can't even get a movement, for instance, nationalized banks. Where, could, where would you begin? You know, we can't even get a World Health Organization that treats the species universally and makes, t- takes, the, takes the revenues and the, and the drugs and stuff so that we can solve problems. We can't even do that. Hey, Mary. So, yeah, I know I'm going too long, but, yes, but yes, so we only have I'm, a gonna wind, I'm gonna wind up just saying I, but we have the capacity to do it. This is what we have to identify. The capacity to do this is in us. So let's find the way to concretize that. And well, I, that's, that's why I appreciate Darko very much what you're doing in your work. You know, the, you. the time has not passed. If we look around the world, Workers throughout the world are refusing the conditions. Yeah. It is, we have no international left that is getting workers to unite on this, but it is going on all over the place in the high professions, in the, the, the most menial death-giving jobs there are. There is a refusal <laughs> to, to do this uh, by a large number of workers and from all strata. But we only have a few minutes, and I, I think that it's great that we do now have the chance. And I had Mary prepare a reading of Our Lady of Hope, and I think we should do that now as a as end of part one of this great book that Pratyush, Niraj, Javed, and Darko put together. I will... I said that it is available on Amazon, but you can find it at A Books, wherever. This book is available. These poems, the long translation of Brecht's Dust Manifest, the, the various essays are available. We will follow up on this. And there is a kind of follow up I did not mention while it's not on our site. The program is not completely together. But in a few weeks, Darko will return with. Patricia McManus, Eric Smith, um, and, and others 
uh, uh, Hugh O'Connell to talk about a new book, Disputing the Deluge, which uh, are, is just coming out right now. So look at our site tomorrow or the next day. You'll see that event. Mary, yes. our Lady of Hope. I dreamt of Lady Hope tonight. She smiled on me so sweetly. Fair as in days of our teen youth, when she kissed me very sweetly. Where did you go, my lady, my love? What country saw your features? Your flaming gaze, your sunburnt hands, your reach to other futures. I've always been here, young man of mine, here where the wise can here where the wise can see me. You grew up and lost your keen eye, and the faint are not able to see me. We must all grow up, my lady, my love. How can I again see you? Remember how knowledge led you to love? Hold fast to that and you'll see me. But you're no longer a girl, my love. Rosie is dawn and eyes shining. We all grow up, old man of mine. I'm a woman now, eyes shining. Pratyush, do you have any final thing to say? Because you're all the way here from Delhi. And last year, you taught me that we need to, instead of clap, raise our hands in ju jubilation, that we find each other in moments like this. Uh, is there anything more you would like to say? Or Niraj, do you have anything more you would like to say? You need to unmute. I would just like to thank all of you and Darko, of course, for giving us this wonderful occasion to be there and to um, talk about all these important issues. Thank you, Nira. And you know, Nira, that I send my love to you and David and the what I what I used to call your kids, which are now elder gentlemen, your sons. Yes, I have given you a long account of them. I know. Yeah, lots of love to you too. Somehow Javed's um, um, video is not working, but you we'll have him. occasion. We'll have occasion to talk to you some yeah. other time. Yeah. Okay, and Pratish, you. could you uh, read what you wrote on from Bloch for us, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just sent it to everyone so that others might have also read it. So okay. I, this is this is a this is uh, the beginning of uh, Ernst Bloch's um, spirit of utopia. So I will just read it, and because lots of discussions are actually going around this. So he says, I am, we are, that is enough. Now we have to begin. Life has been put, put in our hands. For itself, it became empty already long ago. It pitches senselessly, senselessly back and forth, but we stand firm. And so we want to be its initiative and we want to be its ends. Thank you. Thank you, Pratyush. And Darko, we are at our time, but I would like you to give a closure to this meeting and there will be follow-up. I swear we will get this together. Go ahead, Darko. Um, I, I, I don't really think it's my function to give a summary. I don't think it's possible yeah, to yeah. give a summary. Um, it seems that we are a kind of pre-selected audience and more or less in agreement uh, that there is an emergency in I and that we have to do something about it uh, before our children and our beloved uh, die on us and so on. 
uh, or we ourselves. Um, obviously, there is a huge discussion. There is a forking of roads. You know, I have written a lot about it. Uh, do we want movements? Do we want a party? In my opinion, we want both. Um, how to reconcile this? How to use the lessons of um, the negative lessons uh, of Stalinism, which must be used? Uh, how to use the positive lessons? Uh, nobody has spoken about, uh, say, uh, some of the good things that happened. Uh, because the good things are small and f far away from us. You know, they are in Chiapas, or they were in Fidel's Cuba, or they were, you know. But surely we have an awful lot of stuff to draw on. Uh, the problem, I think, very crudely, um, I remember in his last book, um, um, well, I shall skip that. The problem in one word is power. By this, I don't mean violence. Violence is class power. I mean power which is necessary in any community. Power of decision. Okay? Mm. Uh, the whole huge apparatus of modern capitalist society is organized to prevent plebeian power. It's not going to be easy. But, Sorry. thank you. That's we okay. are at the end of our time for okay. today. See you all back here on December 12th, Sunday, the same time. It is 10.30 New York time, which you will uh, uh, find. I will put that event online. And, and I, now that Pratyush is showing, Last year you did this, and thank you, Pratyush. Thank you so much, thank and you. thank you, Darko. And thanks to all who made the time to show up today. We shall meet again, and, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Darko. Thank you. Bye, Darko, and thanks, everyone. Bye, from Darko. Us. Thank you.